Welcome to the Filmmakers 412 podcast. I'm your host, Michael Ray. Today's guest is Robert Scott. Robert is a screenwriter and filmmaker. He's also one of the co-founders of the Carnegie Screenwriters. In today's episode, we talk about everything screenwriting. So here's the episode with Robert Scott. Bob, thank you for coming in today. Thank you for having me, Michael. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great. So tell us a little about yourself. What, um, what do you do when you're not uh, filmmaking? Um, well, I'm, I'm a writer, uh, primarily scripts, shorts, or uh, feature length. Um, I've written poetry in the past. I mean, for a day job. What do you? Oh, a day job. I uh, actually I worked for the old Bell Telephone Company back in the old Ma Bell days, and then AT and T in 1984. The government divested us, split us up, so I ended up with AT and T. And I was a technician there, so I worked there for over 30 years. So how long have you been retired now? It's hard to believe, but I've been retired for 20 years. That's amazing. It is I amazing. I think that's amazing. It's, um, with, with the phone company, you could get a pension once you got 30 years of service in, regardless of age. And yeah. I had like 31 and a half, and they were downsizing and kicking people out, so a bunch of us left. So you got kicked in voluntarily? Voluntarily. Huh? I, uh, I could have stayed, but... Uh, Who wants to stay? Yeah. I, I tell you, I'm getting close to retirement, and I just keep wondering if I want to do it or not. And it's like, it's good to see a success like you. So um, tell us about your history as far as uh, filmmaking goes. How'd you get into this? Well, um, it's kind of been kind of a long and winding road, to quote the Beatles. Uh, I was content working at at and and things were not looking good there. They were downsizing, so I went to night school at Point Park. It was Point Park College then, now university. Not quite sure what I was going to do. That's when I got into writing. Um, so I switched my major to English, working the day, going to school at night, weekends, and uh, got into writing with a buddy of mine, a guy named Ken Lavars, who worked at at and we collaborated on some short stories and then started writing screenplays. So you knew you wanted to write screenplays right at the beginning, or did you start like thinking you were going to no. be a novelist or something? Yeah, I thought um, I was writing things like uh, essays and creative nonfiction. I did a few uh, freelance pieces for the Post Gazette, and I got into poetry and short stories and then I started collaborating with my buddy Ken and he came up one day and said hey I got this idea for a screenplay do you know how to write a screenplay I said no nah, but I'll learn so okay so I, what's the difference between writing for a screenplay and writing a novel what's the difference what how do you have to think differently um, you have to think of a screenplay it, it's a story you've got characters you've got dialogue but it's really a blueprint because <clears throat> you're going to end up whether you make it yourself or sell it, whatever, option it, somebody's going to turn that into a movie, hopefully. And it's a collaborative effort. Uh, the story will change. Uh, there will be various editions or, or versions of the script, and it might be unrecognizable by the time it actually hits the movie screen. But uh, that, you know, a novel is, is, I think, more personal. You write it. It's, it's the story that's in your head. You put it down on paper, you want to get it published. Same with a short story, a poem. But that screenplay is really a blueprint. That's the way I look at it. It's, hmm. it's a collaborative effort, and you as a writer, you have to give up your ego. Unless you're going to produce and direct the thing yourself, and that can be good, but it can also be bad. Because so is the, is the story different? I mean, do you have to think of, okay, that would be a terrible story for a novel, but it'd be a good screenplay or vice versa? Do you ever think well, in those yeah, terms? Well, in a novel, you can explore the character's innermost thoughts and, and get all that down on the page. A script, it's going to be a motion picture. It's got to move, so you have to be able to see it. And that goes back to the old show, don't tell, when you're writing a script. Yeah, it has to be whatever the audience can see. Right. It can't be some. you cannot show thoughts. Right. Unless you do, you know, voiceover or something, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But yeah, I think I think uh, that's the biggest difference is it's action. Even in a a, a drama or a love story, <clears throat> a leisurely story, um, 
there has to be movement. There has to be things you can see on screen, interaction between the characters. Uh, even uh, what was the one with Tom Hanks where he was cast away, right? It was him on the island with the, the tennis ball or the beach ball, whatever he had most of the time. Volleyball, Wilson. But we could see what he was doing, and he, in that I think the device was he could talk to himself or he could talk to the, the volleyball, Wilson, to get the thoughts out. But most of that movie was just him on an island. Right. Some of the, I, I, I watch movies, and I've been watching them more critically from the screenwriting perspective over these last couple of years, and it's like you realize sometimes that there are just characters just to throw some thoughts out there that they couldn't show the thoughts. So you had to have somebody speak those lines. I right. thought that was really interesting. Yeah. yeah you, you know, you have a, a buddy, a best friend, a confidant, whatever, that, you, that the main character can bounce things off of. Uh, but everything, and I mean, this is true for any writing. Every single word has to count. Everything has to, every beat, you know, every moment, but especially in a film, has to count. It has to mean something. And it has to move the story forward. Otherwise, you get rid of it. Right. I mean, there are some things. It seems like you can have more fluff in a feature, of course, than a short. And a lot of that just gets written off to character development or something like that. It's like it's less it's more fluffy, but there's still purpose to it, I guess. Right. Right. Huh. So what's your favorite genre to write in? Uh, well, that's a toughie because um, I've written either co-authoring with, with my buddy or write, writing stuff myself. We've been, kind of been all over the place. Uh, drama, comedy, you know, romantic comedy, horror, sci-fi. Uh, I have a couple shorts, one that I wrote and directed. We produced it last year called Room with a View. It's a short sort of in the vein of Twilight Zone or Alfred Hitchcock. That's the stuff I really love. You know, a thriller, a psychological thriller, or psychological horror or drama with a twist. And the one I'm working on now, it's called Odyssey. It's a drama set in, uh, it's another short, set in 2021 when the pandemic has returned and worsened and it follows the journey of a young soldier trying to get back home to his wife in the aftermath in this hostile world where everything's just gone to heck, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of drawn to those, um, I guess, horror, but also drama and psychological thriller kind of things or supernatural. Okay, so when you're writing for a short film, what's your target time limit, or don't you really have one? Because there, there are festivals that sort of target a certain... Right, right. And, yeah, there's festivals that will take five-minute shorts, ten-minute shorts, or 30-minute shorts, I think. A lot of the ones I've written have been, well, you're familiar with the 48-hour film project. Uh, that's usually seven. five to seven minutes, yeah. something like that. So I try to keep them around 10 pages or less. This one that I'm working on now started out at like four pages. I'm up to maybe nine. <laughs> that That's so. funny how they always, like you, you have a target. And I've only written one film, and I, I figured, ah. Uh, seven minutes or something it ended up being like 17 it's like and it <laughs> was a still stump. you know it's still a good length yeah know. i mean yeah i don't know is it i mean i yeah i think uh, I, when I, you look at like for shorts when you look at submitting to festivals you know they're going to show them in in a block you know of so many films and it might be uh two 10 minute films it could be a 30 minute film um you know, it's so you try and and we've done with Carnegie Screenwriters, we've done a few uh, festivals and um, you try and mix and match with genres and times. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of a, I guess, an art to that. I don't know. But um, okay. but but to go back to that. Yeah, I think you write whatever's in your head. And after, you know, 10 or 20 drafts, and when you've got something you think you can work with, it might be eight pages, might be 10, might be 17. But you don't have a definite, like, okay, this no. is my target, and I'm going to cut not until I get to that. it's something where it's a contest where they specify. Steeltown Entertainment used to do the Film Factory. That was, um, I think, 
up to 15 pages of a script, uh, which writing these shorts that I'm now doing myself, it can be tough to try and push it, depending on the subject matter. Room with a View, I think, is about 10 minutes. I would have liked to have had it longer, but... I think it is longer. I just watched it yeah, in preparation. Yeah, I maybe think a was, little longer, but... I thought it was up to like 14 or so, but maybe... Uh, maybe with the credits, because the credits maybe. are really long. <laughs> <laughs> the I credits are almost as long as the film. <laughs> you know what? It's funny you should mention that, because when I was watching it, I looked at it and I said, wow, there's a lot of left to this film, I was surprised because it's a short, right? And then I, then it was over faster than I thought. And then I looked at the time thing and it, there was nice long credits, which, you know, all us crew members really appreciate, by sure. the way. And that's, yeah. you know, that's important. So um, tell us, let's talk more about Room with a View. Like, was that your first um, time directing or producing or? First time directing a film. Um, over the years, I've directed a lot of theater, which is was primarily my background uh, as far as acting, directing, producing. While I was still writing screenplays, I was also doing a lot of theater. And uh, so I did a lot of directing in theater with various theater companies around here. But I've worked now, I'm with Carnegie Screenwriters. It's a group that's been around about 22 years now. We're writers primarily, but we've got a lot of filmmakers. And we do things like the 48 every year. And we do short films together. And some of us have done features. So we help each other out. So I've worked in various capacities on these films. Producer, you know, AD, PA, whatever needs done. Run to the store and get a bottle, you know, a case of bottled water, whatever it might be. But yeah, this was the first time, you know, I wrote it. I directed it. And um, it was an interesting experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about it on this podcast before, but I did sort of the same thing like last year. <clears throat> but so it is different when it is different when you do it all. I mean, it was really kind of cool. I mean, in a good way, bad way. But okay, looking back at it, what did what do you think you really did right, and what do you think you really did wrong with that shot, that shoot? Well, I think I had a a good, solid script to begin with. You know, we did uh, seated reading with it, and I had people look at it, did a lot of revisions, had um, good actors. The lead, Katie Grant, really carries the film for most of it, if you you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You've oh yeah, it. I know. Katie's Katie's nice, yeah. nice actress. Yeah. So, um, and a great crew. I I have a lot of weak weak points when it comes to the filmmaking. You know, I never went to film school. Um, I don't know much about cameras or lighting. You know, things like that. So I got to surround myself with good people that I trust, who we can collaborate and let them do their thing and get out of their way. You know, this is what I want. This is how I envision it. What do you think? Okay, great. Let's go. Uh, I, we had some problems finding a proper location. You know, there were a few odds and ends that, in looking at it now, I think, you know, uh, I like the script, the acting solid, the cinematography, the sound, all that stuff, the special effects is great. Just a few little odds and ends with things like props, um, set dressing, location. But overall, I'm proud of it, you know. What do you think were the weak points? Uh, well, we shot most of that in one day. Okay, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, and, and we got a location in Carnegie, um, and we had it for the day. So we had to get principal photography done in that one day, and time's always a crunch with these things, you know that. Um, and then we were able to pick up some shots in the woods at South Park, things like that, but most of it was in, contained in one room. Um, so I, it would have been nice to have more time in a better location. Thank, God bless the people in Carnegie. You know, we made it work, but it wasn't ideal. But uh, you know, you have a you have a good crew, good support staff, and hmm. it worked out. Yeah, I thought it was really good. So tell us about Carnegie Screenwriters and your involvement with them. C- Carnegie Screenwriters started. <clears throat> I'm thinking it was around 1998. Um, I was taking screenwriting classes at Pittsburgh Filmmakers. And 
uh, Lorraine Heidecat, you know, teaches uh, some nice introductory sort of classes, and Jeff Monahan, uh, fabulous. Uh, he teaches the more advanced ones. And so I took those, and a few of us were showing up in the same classes. So we started meeting together informally, and we would read each other's scripts, pitch ideas, things like that. And it kind of grew from half a dozen or whatever people sitting in a living room or a cafe to let's make this thing an organization. So we were meeting at the main branch of the Carnegie Library. In I was going to ask that because yeah. you, you're you from Mount Lebanon and it was yeah. that's where the meetings are now. I was wondering right. how it got that name. Yeah, Carnegie Library, Carnegie, it's Pittsburgh. You right. got CMU, you know, it sounded classy. So it became Carnegie Screenwriters. And over the years... There's only two of us original members left, myself and Bob Skorik. Uh, we call him Judge Bob because he's a retired judge. Wendy Grube came into the group not long after we started. She's still around. And then other people have come in and out over the years. But um, How many members do you have now? Oh, lordy. Um, we have our, our meetings... Well, under normal circumstances, we have them in person uh, at the Mount Lebanon Library. We've been doing there a few years now, the third Saturday of each month. And we might have 20 to 30 people show up. We fill the room sometimes. Um, we have on our email list probably 100. And then in recent years, we've been able to create the Facebook group, and that's international in scope now. I couldn't even tell you how many people were on that i'd have to look but a lot and we have people from like australia england ireland you know how'd that happen do you think uh, some some people know we have members in the group like we have uh, trudy kennedy is from australia uh, we have um let's see owen is uh from ireland we have uh, philip from england and we've got people who are from california or new york hmm. and a lot of people who are from Pittsburgh, moved out to the West Coast, or move up to New York or down to Georgia to do film, to do writing, and then they'll move back. So we have a nice eclectic group. Um, yeah, I've been to a couple of your meetings, and I really enjoyed it. The first meeting I ever went to, there was a, a guy, and I don't know who he was, but he was the first guy to hand out script. And it's like, I'm listening to this, and it's like, oh, my God, this is this is interesting, you know in a not not great way it was just like yeah i mean i i'd never even read a script before you know and then um there was a, a woman gets up and he, she tell she starts yeah, yeah jen yeah. jen brown that was her name okay okay jen brown yeah and yeah, yeah it was like when she said okay she gets up and she says okay my story and she's kind of like meek you know yeah she yeah, gets yeah. up and she says my story's about a woman that has a toothache and she doesn't have any money and she holds the dentist at gunpoint i'm thinking i'm like oh my god this is going to be bad this is going to be bad <laughs> and it was one of the funniest things i've ever heard in my life it was amazing yeah, yeah. so i actually invited her to work on the 48 with us the oh, next cool. year cool, so cool, cool. she did and it worked yeah, out she, pretty she's well she's wonderful yeah, yeah she's, she doesn't live around here anymore you know that I, I know she hasn't been around. Yeah, she moved to, to Washington State. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's... Yeah, but anyway, you get you get to Carnegie Screenwriters. You sit down. Everybody BSs for a while, and then they hand out scripts. And there, since there are filmmakers there and actors there, the actors will they'll take some of the parts. And if there's not enough actors, you know, just regular people will take mm -hmm. the parts. But it gives you a good representation of what your script's going to sound like. I mean, I. I was really impressed. I think that's a very valuable resource, and I wish more filmmakers around here would stop by and be a member of that organization. Yeah. And, you know, we're very open, um, very informal. You've been there casual, you know. Uh, and we'll talk some, some business and stuff, but, yeah, then the, the readings are so, yeah, they're invaluable. And hearing, hearing your words read, especially by experienced actors, you know, and you can hear what works and what doesn't and what, you know, what might be clunky. We also, we haven't in a while, but we used to do a monthly reading series, third on third, third Monday of the month at 
the Third Street Gallery, which is at the corner of Third and Third on, in Carnegie. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Philip Savato Savato uh, owns the gallery. He's a tremendous artist and very supportive of of the arts community, the writing community, filmmaking. We've filmed a lot of projects down there. Other people have PJ. Other people have and Carnegie, the town of Carnegie, ironically, which is where we do a lot of our stuff. Um, is very welcoming, very open. You know, they, they've shut down streets for us. You know, we can. That's we great. Use the borough building. Use the local businesses, bars and restaurants, etc. You know. Well, as a as a resource for just contacts, like if you're if you're interested in filmmaking at all, that is the first place I would go because you're going to find these people that have these scripts that want to be made into films. Right. And if you're a filmmaker that wants a good story to work with, it's like a match made in heaven. I mean, is, I don't know yeah. why more people don't take advantage of that. Yeah, it, it is. And it's great for networking, um, sharing information, pitching ideas, bouncing ideas around. Uh, we And again, we, we're open to anybody. Um, we just ask that people be respectful, whether it's in person or on Facebook, you know. And we do have a system of dues in place, but they're not mandatory. You don't have to pay to come. What the dues do is help us establish a film fund. And we can pay for things like if we use the Third Street Gallery, we get some food, or the 48-hour, we need craft services. Or we can grant money to members, maybe a few hundred bucks, to make a short film or whatever their project is. So, you know, that's 36 bucks a year. It's not bad at all. Yeah. So plus, I mean, if if you're not sure you want to spend thirty six bucks, go to a meeting or two yeah. and see what it's like. And you know, yeah. if it, you find it useful, then it's a great resource. Yeah. And Steeltown is another place that I think would be. And you know, you guys team up for that Crew Connect, right? Yes. yes. That's we that's another valuable. That. And uh, when they started their film factory years ago, uh, a number of us would volunteer to help out with that, reading scripts or being there in person to help out. You know, we've we've partnered with the Pittsburgh Film Office, with Pittsburgh filmmakers. Um, so, you know, it's just like a script and filmmaking is a collaborative effort. I think all of us here, independent filmmakers, need to be collaborative and help each other out. You know, we're all in this together. Right, right. So what are you working on now? What's your, well, tell us about that project. Um, it's another short It'd probably be about a 10-minute short. It's called Odyssey. Um, it's about the soldier trying to get mm -hmm. home after the, the pandemic and the world has gone to hell. So he's trying to get back to his wife, Who? Alex Bear, Blair. Alex Blair plays the soldier, and Katie Grant is his wife. In the movie, who's president? Well, it's 2021. Yeah. Um, I don't really say who's president. Uh, so you, should, you should work that in there. Maybe somehow. Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be good. That would be really good. That would be really good. Yeah. So what what are your big challenges there? I mean, like if that's – is it a lot of outdoor stuff where there's people going through the woods, you know, trying yeah, to – Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we had a couple scenes we shot in Katie's living room and um, her backyard, and the rest of it, we, we were – Saturday, yeah, Saturday we spent hours out in South Park Poor Alex, you know, we had him in uniform with a backpack. Okay, run up this hill, you know, <laughs> and I'll walk over there across this stream, you know. But um, he's a trooper. But, uh, yeah, that's finding the locations, um, sound, because some, you can't, you're outside, you can't control that. So I know. <laughs> you know you're out in, <laughs> as you well know, you're out in South Park and a motorcycle goes down Corrigan Drive or, you know. Kids are playing in the playground, birds are chirping, whatever it might be. Yeah. That's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of shoots with Jesse, and he lives out, like, in Coriopolis, and it's like, there's a train that goes by, mm -hmm. it seems like, every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he has a new place now, so I'm, I'm hoping it's a lot better. One of the biggest challenges right now for us and for, I guess, anybody doing this is, you know, the COVID precautions. You know, we have, um, you know, we're wearing the masks, we're trying to maintain social distancing as much as you can on a small, intimate film shoot. Fortunately, the the two leads, Alex and Katie, are a couple in real life. So so they don't have to distance. They don't have to distance themselves. But, you know, everybody else, no, we are going to have 
a fight scene. So that's going to be interesting. We have to choreograph it, rehearse it, you know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. This this coronavirus thing has just put a definite stop to a lot of productions. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's all aimed at me personally. I think it's a conspiracy. I think it is too. To me, ruin my film. You, you know? and me. <laughs> <laughs> so how many more days of shooting do you have? Um, we have one more day scheduled which will be exteriors and then, you know, might need another day to pick up some stuff. What's great about this is, um, well, it's sad, but it's, for the film it's great, is when everything shut down back in March and April, my DP, Mike McCowan, went out and was filming, like, you know, deserted streets. And he went out to Century 3 Mall, which is shut down, and, you know, the parking lot's oh, overgrown yeah. with weeds That's and awesome. all of that. So he, he got a lot of stuff. So we're, we'll open, spoiler alert, we'll open with, you know, all this desolation and, and deserted streets and stores. and Yeah, everything. I saw some, like, drone shots of Pittsburgh, like, pretty much empty. Yeah. So yeah. that you i got to get a hold of those. Yeah, you got to find out <laughs> who that is. <laughs> so, um, what's your favorite genre to write in? I think um, probably... And I've dabbled in in the various genres, but probably the sort of thriller, psychological thriller, supernatural thriller sort of thing. We're working on one now also that also was shut down because of the pandemic. It's uh, a feature script that somebody brought to me and I worked with them on to rewrite and polish. And we took that and we're making a, like an extended trailer as a proof of concept to try and get funding then go make the feature and it's a supernatural thriller um uh, what, what was the one uh basic instinct no not basic instinct fatal attraction it's got sort of a fatal attraction with a, a, a you know glenn close was the psycho stalker with with a, then a supernatural twist so it's about all i can say about it right now <laughs> but we had we just had a couple shots left to pick up and everything shut down. So once we get the trailer done and edited, uh, we'll then try and raise money to make the feature. So th that's a question I have. I mean, I've asked other people this specific question, but there's another question after that. So what is the big difference in writing a short story versus a feature in your head? Like, how do you think differently? What there, well, it has to be, it has to happen like now for a short, right? Right. So... I guess what I'm asking is for how do you trans how do you make a feature proof of concept because it's like you you just take a chunk out of it. Yeah, we took um, I picked some scenes out from the the feature script and and tried to put them together in a coherent fashion to make a trailer like you would see you know for any movie. A trailer or are you just making a short out of it? It's a trailer. For, okay. for for this supernatural thriller, it's a trailer. Okay, but it's like then an extended proof of concept trailer, you know. Okay, so, I mean, I've worked on a couple of different proof of concepts, and they end up trying to be they they're trying to be short stories, but it's just a chunk of the feature, I guess. Or it's, uh, is it a, is it a chunk of the feature, or is no, it a condensed it's feature? Condensed version with the highlights, basically, like. If you were to sit down and watch an extended trailer for any movie coming out, you know, you've got your your highlights. And well, I, know, I understand what a trailer right. is. Right, and that's, that's what we're doing for the, this proof of concept. It's like a, it'll probably end up being like a five-minute trailer with just kind of the highlights, telling the story, but just hitting the highlights of it. So it if really that makes doesn't, sense. I'm having a hard time with it it's yeah. because, you know, how do you make an hour and a half story how do you show i mean if you're just showing pieces of it it isn't itself a story right you know? right right it's not developed correct and that's okay correct. right yeah because concept. In, in this case you want to get investors interested you know so stuff that'll scenes that will grab them you know without spoiling anything too much you so know? you don't want to give it away I, well i guess for 
for the sake of, of this for like investors, say I'm coming to you and I want a million dollars, you know. You ain't getting it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know you, we've got the, this finished script. We've got this five-minute trailer or three-minute trailer or whatever it's going to end up as that kind of gives you the highlights. And since it's a supernatural thing, maybe some scares in there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, in condensing a, a feature down to a short, I don't know if you remember that movie uh, a few years back, Frozen River with Melissa Leo. No. It was about women who made a living smuggling illegal aliens from Canada into the U.S. by driving across the Frozen River. And Melissa Leo was nominated for an Academy Award. She didn't win for that, but she did win supporting for um, the one with Christian Bale was a fighter. Anyway, I digress. The, the writer-director wrote a feature script and couldn't get anybody to look at it. So she condensed it into a little short and played it at festivals. But isn't it isn't it a totally different story at that point? It is, because you're really condensing it. Um, but that got her... The attention she Attention, needed. recognition, investors, and then she could do the feature. Isn't that so. why people write shorts? I mean, everybody writes shorts. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of different reasons. But most people I know write shorts hoping to be discovered. That's, is, that's valid, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, as, as a writer, as a filmmaker, you've got... You've got some shorts. What do you do with them? You send them to festivals. You know, send them into WQED to play on Filmmakers Corner, which is great. Um, maybe you can get them. Some some of the streaming services now do shorts. You know, but ultimately, what you're hoping is it's your calling card. It's your video calling card. Hmm. They'll see, okay, this guy you know wrote this. This guy made this. He's a good director or a good DP or whatever it might be. A good writer. We'll take a look at this feature length. So, yeah, it seems like though these shorts are always lacking in something. You know what I mean? It's like you might have a great cinematographer, but lousy acting, or you might have a great acting and lousy cinematography, lousy lighting, or yeah. like the sound yeah. sucks or whatever. But it seems like these low budget things are just the, the, you never have everything hitting on all cylinders. It's hard to do because yeah, you're trying to make a film with very little money, you know, and uh, using people who are good, but maybe they work day jobs, you know. They're maybe Most of us do. You know, so we, and that's that's the life of whether it's indie filmmaking or community theater, you know, it's, we work day jobs and we go out and do this for the love and the passion. And yeah, you, you might skimp on one area and splurge say sound you sound is really important so you make sure you want to get good sound but maybe the lighting isn't quite right or or like you said maybe the acting you know if you're using your dentist's daughter or something you know right right uh you it, it's important to get talented people in all areas right but it's not always easy to do and there's a lot of competition there's a lot of people making films hmm. um let me ask you this. This just struck me. If you're looking for short film ideas, can you pretty much just open up a book of short stories? Now, does that translate well from story to film? You, I mean, I know it, there's things, but is that a yeah, good source, do you think? Yeah, it can be. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my short Room with a View, the original concept came to me in a dream and I was still working at AT&T. You weren't, you weren't doing drugs or anything. Well, that's maybe a discussion for another time. <laughs> but no, I wasn't. No. Kids, don't do drugs. Stay in school. No, I, uh, what's, I had this, What school? <laughs> I had this dream, and I went and told my buddy Ken about it. We had been collaborating on scripts, and we wrote it as a short story. I never really did anything with it, and it sat, it sat in a drawer for 20 years. And one day I was kind of fishing around for an idea. We were doing seated readings at the Third Street Gallery for Halloween. And I thought, wait a minute, I got this. I dug it out and I wrote it as a script, which was a challenge because in the short story, inner thoughts, you know, the character's inner thoughts, how do you show that? And um, that's why it's, you know, it's credited as like based on a story by 
screenplay by you know me, but it was the story was developed by my buddy Ken and I, you know. So, so besides doing hallucinogens, how do you <laughs> how do you come up with ideas? There are ideas everywhere. I think. Do you walk around with a notebook? Are you one of those guys? I used to. I used to. Honestly, I did. I, I always carried a notebook. I would write down ideas. I would write down like uh, little character sketches of people I would see and what their quirks were or whatever. And, and then I, I kind of stopped doing that. But I have notebooks, at, dozens of notebooks at home. Um, for you kids, that's something you write in. You don't necessarily <laughs> type it into a phone. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, just ideas come to you. Um, this one, Odyssey, came about because of the Steel Town Quarantine Contest. What can you do in a short film with a minimum crew and, and actors? And the theme was home. So I envisioned this guy just trying to get home. Um, yeah, so, you know, ideas are out there. It helps if you're a little warped, um, you know, crazy imagination, but... So when you do your writing, are you one of those people that do you start with, um, like, do you know where you're going with when you start writing? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll have an ending in mind. Uh, like this latest short, I had an ending in mind, in, envisioned, you know, it was in there. And I had to change it up somewhat, but it's it's still pretty close to the original. And other times maybe you just let the characters take you. That's a Stephen King kind of thing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, his, I mean, you know, obviously he's very successful, but I've never his writing just kind of rambles to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like drives me crazy. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like the stand. I don't know if you read that. Mm -hmm. You know, apocalyptic uh, event. It took me several tries to get into that, and once I did, I couldn't put it down, and I ended up reading it a number of times. But it did take a while to get into it. You know, and I, I like the mini series that they did. In fact, I hear they're going to remake it. But, but anyways, yeah, there's there's just ideas everywhere, and sometimes they do come from dreams, or something I overhear or see. I might see a couple in a restaurant, and you always ask yourself, what's the story? What's going on with them? Or you ask, what if? You know, what if this happened? What if that happened? So. Yeah, that's cool. So, you've. How many films have you worked on over the years? Oh, geez. I don't know. Probably a couple dozen or so. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of short films. I've been in some as an actor. Uh, I was in a feature as an actor, a local indie thing years ago. I've been an extra on a couple of the Hollywood movies that have filmed here. And uh, I've done various things, you know, now directing, but I've been producer um, AD, PA, crafty, whatever needs done. You know how it goes, right? Especially right. on the forty-eight. So, so when do you think do you think all directors should take acting lessons? Do you think that helps? I think it does help. I think, and, and the same applies to writers. You know, whether you're writing a screenplay oh, really? or a stage play, that's why I took my first acting class to get a feel for what it's like on the other side. And I got bit by the bug, and you know got into acting heavy duty. I don't do theater anymore, but still do some film. But I, th I think it helps. And I think as a director, it really helps to know the various jobs. You know, I'm, For sure. I, I don't, I didn't go to film school. I don't know, like I said before, I don't know a lot about cameras or, or lighting, how to set that stuff up. But I know people who do people that are good and talented and reliable and I've worked with and I trust them and that's where you get into the collaboration you know I'm not um, Clint Eastwood right you know but uh, so yeah. you've been on a lot of different sets what's the biggest mistake you see like new filmmakers make um, I think underestimating the time you need is a biggie hmm. you know and I've done that myself and underestimating the budget and what you might need uh, as far as resources. And I think you have to, like I said, you have to get good people in place that you trust and who trust you. And there's a give and take. I want to get a certain shot. The DP says it's better from over here or 
maybe the lighting should be over there, whatever. The sound guy has to go over there. You know, the AD comes up with some good ideas. But I, I think the biggest things are the preparation, pre-production, you know. Hmm. Knowing how much time you need is a big... Because, you know, you've been on shoots that have gone maybe 16, 18, 20 hours, you know. That's crazy. Yeah, it's it's easy to, you know, one thing goes wrong, holds you up a little bit, and then mm -hmm. something else goes wrong, and it just steamrolls. And that's where that pre-production comes in, and, and, you know, having storyboards and having a shot list and really discussing it with everybody involved to make sure it's doable, you know, and you trust your, your AD and your DP and everybody else, you know. So what's the most memorable film experience you've ever had, like on set? Oh, wow. Is anything like major catastrophe happen or really something <laughs> cool? Uh, well, I'd say with the 48 hour ones, certainly there's, yeah, little of everything, um, catastrophes. The very first one we did, whenever that was, 2008, whenever the first one was here, the, we had too many locations that were too far apart, so we ended up traveling a lot, trying to get all this stuff shot. And then the director and the editor spent all night editing this thing, and then the computer crashed. Oh. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, so that's, and, and actually, we just made it in under the wire, time-wise turning it in, but it was unusable. So they had to download it again and turn it in. So they were able to show our film, but we just weren't eligible oh. for any awards. Yeah. So things like that. Um, and, and that goes back to time crunch, not being prepared. I mean, it was the first year for it. None of us knew what we were doing yeah. or what to expect. I think everybody complains about that rendering time. Like they didn't build that into it. <laughs> the rendering, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sucking your soul out. All right. So what's your opinion of the local film, indie film community? Do you think it's pretty good? Oh, I think it's very good. <clears throat> there are so many excellent people here. Um, and for the most part, everybody's really cool. I mean, you know, I've, and this goes for theater too. There's very few people that I can say, boy, I wouldn't want to work with that person again. You know, everybody, I think it's, it, they've got that independent spirit. Let's work together to get it done. There's a lot of talent, a lot of talent here. You know, whether you're talking writers, actors, you know, DPs, sound people or lighting, a lot of talent. Um, yeah, I agree with you. There's some really interesting people here. I mean, people like PJ just blow me away. It's like... P PJ is a legend, I'll tell you. He's, well, you know, he's you amazing. Know, you know, it's funny. It's like, if you don't... He comes off as this like, you know, jolly old guy. And he's like extremely no like when I got him up here, he just blew me away. Yeah. I mean, when I did that interview with him, it's like that you are not the person I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean Yeah. Yeah. He's really cool. He knows his stuff inside and out. And he's really good to work with. Really nice guy. Oh yeah, he's really a, a nice he's guy. He's a teacher at heart. Yes. I mean, he would he would stop what he was doing and he would explain to the PA exactly what's going on. Right. And it's like, wow. I mean, that's that's awesome. It's it's terrible that he's leaving CCAC. I know. I yeah. mean, that's because he built a nice program. I know. I don't know what's going to happen to it. Yeah. Well, I guess they have somebody in the interim, and they're looking for somebody but they really in a short time developed a wonderful program there oh my i, I just, worked with some of those students on some films and they really they're well prepared and they have top of the line equipment yeah know? yeah yeah he put a nice program together okay well in conclusion here um is there any advice you'd want to give the uh, local filmmaking community in general um i think you have to have a passion you know, it's a dream you want to pursue, but you also have to be realistic. And that's where things like the preparation come in. You have to know what you're doing, at least know something, and then surround yourself with those good people who might be experts in their field. Respect one another. Maintain a sense of humor because you're going to need it because everything goes wrong. <laughs> it gets know. stressful. I mean, you it, have it is all very these, stressful. You have all these people depending on your decision and you make yeah. the wrong decision and all of a sudden. Whew. Yeah. And, and as somebody who came into this later in life, you know, I'm almost 70 now and I'm just directing films. 
it's not too late. It's never too late. You're never too old, you know. You look at Clint Eastwood. I keep going back to him, but that man's he's a marvel. Guy's yeah. what, in his 80s? He's good. He writes, directs, acts, you know, produces, and he's got the stamina of a racehorse. I mean, it's just – so it's never too late. And you can change career paths or you can go off and do this stuff on the weekends, whatever it might be. But just love what you're doing it and doing it for the love. Don't do it for the money. <laughs> you know? Good. Yeah, don't you're do it for You're not going to make money. any money. You could. You, you could. could. Hit, you could hit a home run, and everybody yeah. wants that. Yeah. But I agree with you. You know, I want to sell the, the screenplay to Hollywood for, you know, 200,000K or a million or whatever, or, you know, but in the meantime, I'm doing this here, you know. Just for the love of it. Just for the love of it. You got to love it. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. I Michael. appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you found us on our webpage, please leave a comment and let us know what you think. If you found us on iTunes or Spotify and you like the show, please leave a rating or review. And whatever you do, hit the subscribe button.